Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to our first public program of 2023, our very first uh, live from the studio now introducing Natalie Porschewitz. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Fauni Barra, and I'm the Public Programs and Residency Coordinator here at Griffin Art Projects. Um, before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that our work takes place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Stolo nations, to whom we are deeply grateful. As well, we would like to thank uh, the North Vancouver Rec and Culture, as well as the Friday Foundation for their support of the residency program. A few housekeeping notes before today's presentation. If you would like to see the live captions uh, for today's presentation, you can enable this by selecting the CC live transcription button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, however, if you're experiencing any technical issues uh, with the Zoom interface, you can also head to our Facebook page uh, and watch live from there as we're gonna be live streaming. Finally, I want to mention that there will be also a chance at the end of today's presentation for audience questions. So if at any point throughout the presentation you have a question, please feel free to use the uh, Q&A dialog box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you want to raise your hand to ask a question, please feel free to do that. Just uh, know that uh, this is a recorded event. So if you do choose to go live and ask your question, uh, your voice will be recorded in the event. Uh, so anyways, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the winner of the Griffin Art Project's BIPOC Studio Award 2023, Natalie Porchwitz. Natalie Porchwitz is an artist living and working on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Esquamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Her research is propelled by material exploration driving on modes of making that include collecting, accumulating, arranging, editing, and writing. She is curious about the ways in which the landscape is shaped by humans and non-humans through systems of organization, networks of support, and ruptures within these systems. By reconfiguring everyday objects, elemental substances, and other life combinations, she attempts to create conditions for material events. Now we'll hear uh, directly from her, uh, Natalie. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Fauna. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, I just want to start by thanking Griffin Art Projects for this incredible opportunity to have this amazing space, which I'll give you a, a quick tour of shortly. Um, but I just want to say thank you to Fauna and to Lisa and to the Friby Foundation and to Jordana, who I just met today. Um, so yeah, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, so I guess I'll just start with a, a, a quick little mini tour of the, of the studio. Um, so I'm going to start over here. I'll show you. It's a little awkward with my computer, but I've got my ink making station over here. And uh, I've got a few things around. I've got some work up on the walls. And so I'm trying to talk and walk and show at the same time. And then I've got a few ink experiments. I've got a lot of stuff up on the walls. And then here's my uh, kind of work area, which you can see there's a lot of other mess and work in progress. <laughs> so just to give you a, a little sense of what's been going on here so far. Um, but I thought I would start by giving you a little bit of context by showing you some of my research from the last few years and what I've been thinking about and focusing on. So I'm just going to bring up a, a slideshow. And I'm just going to share the screen here. Sorry, one second. Oops. I had it all set up and then I don't know what happened. <laughs> Oops. Okay, now I lost you. Uh, okay, back to Zoom. 
back to screen share. Oops, almost there. Ta-da! <laughs> okay, here we go. Hopefully you can see a couple of photos on my slideshow here. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So um, I just wanted to start by talking about dirt. <laughs> um, dirt has been one of my areas of research and focus and interest in the past few years. Um, I guess starting from the beginning of COVID, I really started thinking about dirt and, and what it is and what it's made out of and um, how we can contribute to making it better. And um, yeah, so I, I started noticing how dirt was made um, just on the streets and all around me. And I noticed that humans make a lot of dirt. <laughs> and I guess it's important to kind of define dirt. And, you know, there are a lot of different definitions for dirt, but my own definition, I kind of sum it up as um, stuff that makes soil dirty. <laughs> and so that can include plastic and detritus and non-natural elements, um, because eventually everything kind of becomes dirt and which ultimately ends up becoming earth, which also ultimately ends up becoming rocks. <laughs> so dirt being the kind of loose stuff and rocks being the bigger hard stuff. And so this is, geology has been a, sort of a persistent interest and area of research for me. So it's something that keeps coming up over and over again. Um, so here we've got on the left, there's some plastic that's becoming dirt by being driven over again and again by cars. And then on the right, uh, a drawing that I made using dirt to make the drawing, a drawing of rocks. <laughs> okay. Um, so this thinking about dirt sort of led into, I mean, you know, in dirt, I'm also thinking about mass and what, um, you know, this bigger amalgamation of how the landscape is shaped by humans and non-humans and, and other larger invisible forces. And so this is an installation I made in 2020 called Stalagmites. And it's a mixed media installation with living elements. It's kind of uh, set up as a provisional display. It's kind of part flea market, part garden of curiosities. And so there are a lot of living elements um, scattered throughout. I'll just go skip ahead. Um, and sort of mixed in amongst ambiguous objects and um, there are spills and leaks and um, it did change daily. I, I was going in every day. I had to care for these plants and try to keep them alive. And I would also bring in new elements and I, I almost treated the installation as a studio. Um, and there is some video documentation that I thought about showing today, but I might skip that. I'll save that for another time. Um, and yeah, there was also a very extensive materials list uh, that went on for several pages. As you can see, a lot of the materials are, like I said, a bit ambiguous um, and they're all mixed in. There's a lot of leaking and spilling of one thing into another. Um, and so things would be in various different states of, of decay. Um, and what else do I wanna say about it? There's kind of um, a sense of ritual involved and in, in, in kind of an invisible choreography of going in every day and tending to these plants and um, you know checking in on the spills, maybe spilling something new following spiders around and seeing what was going on in there. So I was, it was sort of, um, I almost saw it as a, as a mathematical equation of dirt in a way um, with thinking of it as these sort of um, equations with parentheses around them, if you can 
imagine that. <laughs> so even though I am interested in mess and dirt, I'm always also at the same time trying to make sense of it all. And so um, I just, I developed this diagram as a way to kind of put things into perspective or not really into perspective, but I guess to, to give, some, give me some sort of a, a compass to work from, um, a, a sort of guide. I'm really interested in uh, the how-to genre and um, manuals that will show me how to do something. So having this kind of more structured diagram was really helpful for me to start thinking about all of these, this kind of like splatter uh, or kind of, I guess, scatter plot of emergence that I'm, that I'm always uh, working with and thinking about. And um, yeah, so this kind of led me to my next installation called Unknown Variables um, at the Belkin. It was part of my um, MFA graduate show. And I was starting to think about the diagram and how I could sort of reverse engineer the diagram um, into sort of into a three-dimensional version of itself and um, transform it into kind of a drawing, a, a three-dimensional drawing of itself, basically. And so here is uh, an image of the installation. It's fairly large. It's really hard to photograph. Um, I'll try to show you some, well, here's another wide shot. Uh, one of the sort of key elements of the installation was a very fine thread net that I made to fit the space. And it's kind of, you can sort of see it, it's stretched across the room. And then there are a lot of things that are kind of suspended within that um, and, or, or hanging from it. Some things look like they're just caught within it. So sort of thinking of a net as a, a kind of double-sided economy where on one side it acts as a precarious support, but on the other side, it also kind of indiscriminately catches things within it. Again, there were some living elements within the, within the installation, um, but I had it more set up so it would sort of look after itself. I didn't have to go in every day. And I was, I was more interested to see how things would sort of unfold on their own. I did have a grow light set up uh, that would come on on a timer overnight to keep things so that things would have a, would, could stand a chance at least of survival and, and something. It was, it was quite interesting to see how uh, the living elements went through these different cycles. And also to notice how resilient a dandelion is. Very, very resilient. Um, let's see. And um, also thinking about the line as a trajectory or a path, um, a way of mapping and um, you know, another, uh, an element of drawing that can then be translated into something three-dimensional. Here's another wide shot. I didn't really include very many um, examples of where you can really see the net, but like I say, it was quite <laughs> difficult to actually photograph. It's almost invisible until you're really close to it. Uh, so it has a certain lightness to it. And so um, about a year ago, or no, I guess a few years ago, I started making charcoal, started making willow charcoal as a drawing tool to use as, you know, my own um, materials for making drawings. Um, it's a traditional um, way of making charcoal using willow. And um, there's a, it's a very simple process actually to make the charcoal. But through this process, I discovered that actually you can turn any organic matter into charcoal and I became really fascinated with this material transformation and so I um, this was early on in my process and it was a piece of moss that, that some Stellar's jays had knocked out of a tree and I put it in a can and sealed it up and put it into a fire 
and it came, it worked. It turned into this beautiful, very, very delicate charcoal um, that was a complete a, a transformation of what it was to this, um, you know, it's like a perfect replica of itself in a way. Um, it doesn't lose much of its size. Um, and so it just looks exactly the way it was, except, except that it's been completely carbonized. So I started um, making charcoal and uh, thinking about this material trans transformation and, um, and uh, what was I going with that? <laughs> um, oh, and thinking about invasive species as well. And so um, uh, taking, invasive species and transforming them into something that then could be examined in a different way and sort of removing all of the, I guess, maybe baggage that it might come with and look at it um, as something else, as a material, purely as a material. And so this was leading up to a show that I had at Artspeak last summer called Overflow Chart. And um, I was also making, at the same time, I was making these sort of pseudo botanical drawings of um, images of weeds that were generated using um, AI. And so this was a few years ago and AI has definitely come a long way since then, but I was really fascinated with um, this kind of weird possibility of an AI coming up with what a weed was or what, what it thought a weed looked like. And, and then I was painting the, or I was making these drawings using materials that I'd collected myself. So, um, you know, I guess materials that I'd foraged and by forage, I, I don't necessarily mean in the woods. Sometimes it was in the woods, but the foray could include uh, the trash or the sidewalk or the supermarket. Um, so it's a, a collection of inks, not unlike the inks that I have here, which I'll talk a little bit more about shortly. Um, so this was at Art Speak. Uh, it's called, it's from an installation called Transpirations. Here's a, a bigger view of that. So I made these ceramic pieces, vessels, and then um, I made these arrangements using the charcoal um, and a few other weeds, live weeds. Um, in, I made these arrangements in the vessels and then displayed them. And here's another example from ArtSpeak. Um, I made a lot of paper out of recycled papers and there was a table with offerings that would change every week. Um, anything from charcoal pieces to handmade paper pieces to um, seeds to marbled paper. There was it kind of, you know, it would, it would change up depending on sort of what I was working on in the studio at that time. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to the AI images just because um, it sort of led me to this residency, which I was thinking, I'd been making inks for a while and I really wanted to explore the idea of um, using botanical drawings as a kind of por as portraiture, self-portraiture of myself. Um, so I'll get into that a little bit more, but first I just wanna uh, list some of the inks that I used to make these drawings, which were stinging nettle, black tea, hibiscus flower, chlorophyll, onion skin, arbutus bark. And then I sort of uh, enliven them a little bit with some aquarelle pencils. I wanted there to still be a, a, a sense of artificiality to the drawings um, or um, maintain that kind of otherworldliness that the AI drawings themselves uh, had. Um, so then my plan was to come to Griffin and go out and gather materials to make inks. And here is a picture of my ink making station. And I had already collected a lot of things that I was hoping to try out. And um, I, 
well, I can show you a little close up here, or you can't see it very well, but there's butterfly pea flower to make this beautiful blue, and there's um, black walnut, and um, on this little hot plate at, in this photo, there's red amaranth. And so it's kind of exciting, but I wasn't really sure where I was going with this. And I got here, I wanted to make these self portraits sort of based on my, um, on my background. Um, my, my mom is Japanese, she's from Japan, and my dad is from Germany. And um, I grew up thinking about, or I grew up with, um, my mom did a lot of ikebana, which is Japanese flower arranging. It's, a, it's one of the Zen practices. Um, and my dad also had a, an interest in porcelain. He comes from an area, um, he grew up close to Dresden, which is really well known for mice and porcelain, mice in China. And um, so they both had this interest in vessels and ceramics. And um, uh, so I was sort of imagining these botanical drawings as being kind of like arrangements that would also be a kind of portraiture of myself. And um, so I got here and I started wandering around and mostly it's it's not really a great season to I didn't really think that part through very well I guess it's not the ideal season to be going out and collecting plant matter or um, looking for uh, weeds because really there are only two, two kinds of weeds right now Himalayan blackberry and English ivy <laughs> and so I don't know. It would, at first, it was really hard to get inspired by these two, these two weeds that, that were around, and I, it, it rained a lot when I first got here, and so I, I didn't, I wasn't so inclined to go wandering around collecting materials. So I did what I normally do to familiarize myself with the place. I, I started making arrangements in the studio. And um, maybe you could tell by my mini tour earlier, I'm not exactly a light traveler. I like to bring a lot of stuff and have a lot of materials around me all the time. Um, and so I started making these arrangements in the studio just as a way, just sort of as a point of entry. And I, I was still thinking about um, overgrowth and invasive species and weeds, um, but, I guess I wasn't really thinking of them in the same way that I had initially planned. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, yeah. so then after I made these arrangements and I uh, sort of as another, a, a way to just start my process, um, I started making drawings of the arrangements and I would use the inks. I would make an ink wash first and then I would go over them with pen or pencil crayon or um, various different drawing materials. Here's another example of uh, an arrangement and then a drawing based on the arrangement. Um, I feel like I was going to say something about that. I can't remember what it was now, but um, I'll get back to it. So yeah, still thinking about overgrowth. Um, and I guess I was sort of thinking about excess and how um, even those two uh, kinds of weeds that I kept encountering in this area, the, the Himalayan blackberry and the, um, and the English ivy, you still really get a, the sense of excess and um, this kind of uh, flowing over of growth and a, some kind of aggressive growth in a way. <laughs> um, and maybe I, I kind of maybe started to realize that I was less interested in invasive species and more interested in weeds, kind of these more quiet, there's something a bit more quiet about weeds. They're a bit more, um, they're, they're less aggressive somehow. They're, they're, they're still very successful, but there's something in the language difference between those two things that I, I feel is important, but I'll, I'll come back to that. 
Um, so I'm just going to show an example of some Ikebana uh, from a book that my mom had. And um, just to show that, so one also is a very uh, clear reference to overgrowth, which I just love, and math mess. And, um, and the one on the right highlights the vessel. And the vessel is a really important part of Ikebana. It's equally as important as the arrangement. So they're often thought of in, in combination with each other. And then also about a year ago, I started um, doing some research. Uh, my parents are thinking of moving out of their very long-term home in Radium Hot Springs. And I started, I, I did a project where I documented all of their vessels, uh, which were a lot. Um, and this is an example of some mycin, um, porcelain ware that my dad has as part of his, it's a, a family heirloom, I guess you could say. And so then I kind of, it reminded me that I had borrowed this book from the UBC library and I've had it for about four and a half years <laughs> called Dressed in China. And so I, was, I started looking through these uh, images in the book and I had a, lots of them marked and I thought about it and a lot of them. Um, so this would have been during the Rococo period and they are about excess and there is a lot of embellishment. And so I started making, I thought another way in. Um, also, you have to understand that this is a quite a short residency. I've only been here for just over a month and I'm already thinking about you know, it's already coming to a close. So I, you know, I was just trying to make as much work as I could in a short period of time. So anything that kind of um, felt like an entry point, I would just follow it and see where it led. So I started making drawings of vessels. And this one is, it's a drawing based on an actual vase. Um, and it's it's a mycin ware vase, and I have just over embellished it, and I've just uh, again thinking about overgrowth and um, and oh I didn't bring up I wanted to mention just briefly about um, I wanted to shout out to Dion Smith Doki who also did a residency here I think last summer, and um, Dion translated. Uh, a text by Georges Didi Huberman. And I don't, I can't remember. Oh, I think it's called Resemblance. Resemblance. And I'd have to look up the title. It's been very inspirational to me. It is talking about imprints and um, imprints across time. And then this has been a very important and recurring theme in my work, I realized probably for my entire art career. <laughs> and so um, thinking about the imprint, thinking about overgrowth, um, and thinking about fragments, these are all uh, have kind of come into, I guess, this is now sort of becoming a series. Um, uh, but I'll move ahead to this, the next drawing that I made, which is also based on a vessel. And it's a Japanese um, vessel from the Jomon period um, and a particular part of the Jomon period where they're making this, these types of vessels that are, are called flame, flame type. And um, Jomon literally means inlaid with ropes or cords. So the way they would produce the, the pottery was they would, um, you know, press cordage into the clay and then remove it and then it would leave an, an, an imprint. So again, of course, imprint was coming up for me um, and, and lineage. This type of pottery, I, I can't remember if I already mentioned, but it's about 2,500 to 3,500 years um, BCE. So it's it's been around. <laughs> and the Jomon period did go for quite a long time, but this, this particular style uh, that sort of mimics flame um, was very, interesting to me. So again, I've exaggerated it um, with lines and um, thinking about my personal lineage and um, 
and history and archaeology. I also have a background in archaeology, as does my my mother. And uh, so that tends to creep back into and the vessel has always been such an important representation of a culture um, because it's one of the things that lasts within the um, archaeological record um, because it's made of the substance that actually holds up to time as opposed to a lot of um, softer things like fabrics or um, things that break down more quickly. So it's this a really strong indicator of what people were thinking about and what um, you know what was uh, happening culturally in a specific moment or in this case over a long period of time. Um, so this is something that I'm, I'm just really fascinated by. And this is part of again the same series. It's not a vessel, but it's a, a Mycen porcelain figurine, uh, quite a large figurine. Um, some of these, these animal figures were up to four feet and porcelain is really difficult material to um, manipulate in, in that way. Um, so very challenging works. Um, but I was just drawn to it as an object and then I've embellished it. I've, I've kind of set the goat within this entanglement of, um, I guess, a net, because I always come back to nets and then uh, sort of an exaggeration of the animal's fur or hair. And I, I put this slide in because this is, it's interesting that this is pretty much what I look at out of the window here. Um, every day at Griffin. Um, and I do think that this has kind of come into um, the aesthetic that I've been drawing on here a little bit. Uh, so yeah, that's that. Oh, and this is, I still want to do one more drawing for that series, which is this um, on the left here. It's, it's a ceramic shell um, from Kyoto. And I thought it would be a really interesting pairing with the um, mice and goat. Uh, but then I also have this amazing actual shell that could potentially be the, the fourth drawing. But just sticking with the theme, I'll probably do the ceramic um, version of it. Um, okay, so where was I? Um, I mean, I could, I don't want to get too much into all of these, uh, the history of all of these vases, but that's sort of what I was thinking about. Um, so as I mentioned, I was, I was quite motivated early on to make more traditional um, representation, botanical representations that I would then embellish into these portraits. And um, I somehow couldn't make myself do it. I had all of these images that I wanted to work from and I was taking lots of photos of weeds out there, but then somehow I ended up instead making this drawing, <laughs> this drawing of dirt. And um, I call it nice piece of dirt. And it's quite small. It's only about this big eight and a half or nine by 11 or something like that. Um, and it was a very satisfying process to work in that way. I find it very meditative to try to objectively try to re represent something. Um, and, but I also, yeah, I haven't, it's not finished. I do want to embellish it more, but it kind of reminded me that, um, it kind of reminded me that I'm interested in this work by Albrecht Durer, which is called Great Piece of Turf. Um, so my, that's why mine's called Nice Piece of Dirt. <laughs> uh, yeah, back to Albrecht Durer, Great Piece of Turf. And then like weirdly, Durer kept coming up in my research and um, well, if you'll humor me, I just want to show you this kind of weird connection that I made. So the same artist, uh, Johann Joachim Kandler, 
who made that the mice and goat in the 1730s, also made this rhino, which is um, pictured here on the left out of porcelain. And so he would have, he clearly had not seen an actual rhino <laughs> and was referencing probably Durer's rhinoceros from 1515, um, which then kind of went into more uh, public um, distribution through these posters of this rhinoceros called Clara in the early 1700s um, that people did have access to. Um, but I do find it very fascinating that, um, or maybe he went to see the actual woodcut that, that Durer had made, um, but it looks almost identical. It's, it's clearly based on this, this representation and not an actual, not the actual animal, which then, I mean, I don't know how much I should get into this, but it kind of brings me back to the AI and the, and the imprint and thinking about how um, the AI is collecting these fragments and creating an image based on this collection of ideas of other people that other people have um, sort of taught it to understand. So for the weeds, for example, I'm just gonna go skip ahead. So for the weeds, AI image that I was used, using to make this drawing, it would have collected all different kinds of fragments of, and bits and pieces, not of weeds, but of other things, chain link fence and um, French bulldog and you know whatever all of the genes are to create this image of what it understands to be a weed. And that's kind of what Durer was doing as well at the time that he had made this woodcut. He'd never seen an actual rhinoceros, but he had heard other people's accounts of what a, rhino a rhinoceros looked like and based a drawing from these descriptions, from these little fragments and pieces that other people had offered um, that he then interpreted into what he believed a rhinoceros looked like. And so it's kind of a re reverse AI in a way. And um, as well, then, you know, almost, or yeah, almost 200 years, more than 200 years later, Candler is making, is also collecting these fragments in a different way. So it's, again, this imprinting across time that I'm, I'm just really fascinated by. Um, okay, and if we're just gonna go down this road a little bit further to talk about horse tails because horse tails are so amazing. Um, you see them everywhere. They are, some people call them invasive species, an invasive species, but they're not, they're a weed and uh, they're not technically an invasive species if you wanna you know, make the differentiation that way. Um, but they are, um, they are weeds or some people find them weeds. They're hard to get rid of, but they're also living fossils. They've been around for 350 million years. Uh, the original tree version of it were called calamites. And there are lots of fossils of these around. Um, what you're looking at right now, by the way, is a photo of horse tails that I put into um, an AI, uh, again, image generator, but you could only upload it as a portrait. So this is a portrait that it made using the um, <laughs> using the horse tail image that I fed into it. Um, anyways, these calamites have been around for um, hundreds of millions. Did I mention that? Millions of years. And um, they did produce most of the gas or most of the oil in Alberta is produced from these calamites. There were entire forests covering all of Alberta and um, they have then gone on to produce this oil. Um, but so they're in a way they're just very successful and they are again this imprinting across time and, and they're you know people call them living fossils and I um, I keep going. I keep going back to fossils and my interest in geology, uh, and so uh, 
these are a couple of drawings that I made while I have been here as well. On the left, it's uh, kind of based on calamite fossils and they're kind of spewing um, seeds or they're, they're creating these traject tra trajectories or vectors, I guess, from their branches. And, um, and then on the, on the right is another collage based on a fossil that I was looking at of calamites. So these are kind of things that uh, keep coming into my work and my practice. Plants, but then rocks, but then plants again, but then, you know, this constant flipping back and forth. Um, and then I did have a, about a week where I was making a lot of frottage uh, pieces. And um, this is an, on the left is an older carving that I made. It's my to-do list, which permanently has laundry on it. And so I was, I've been, <laughs> so this is a frottage of some, some laundry, but I've been um, doing frottages of all different kinds of things just around the studio. Um, and thinking of the frottage as kind of an imprint and it does resemble a fossil in a way and it is kind of capturing it into this pressed version of itself also. And some more just kind of quick pieces that I've done. Uh, page of rocks that's kind of maybe you can see it behind me and another a, a reverse frottage of a rock it's actually there's actually laundry under there too but it's not as noticeable <laughs> as long not as recognizable as laundry um, and this page of pebbles also behind me um, pebbles that are actually just from old drawings that and bits and pieces that I've cut out and then collaged from old drawings. And I'll just end with this etching <laughs> that I made in 1996. Uh, it's of a fossil from the Burgess Shale, which is in the Rockies in BC in Yoho National Park. And I'm sure some of you were at Kathy Slade's talk at the CAG last week um, when she brought up the idea that artists only really have one work that they keep producing for their entire career. And she was making reference to um, Nietzsche's eternal return. But I, I do think it's kind of funny that I was making this, these fossil, I was already thinking about fossils in my artwork more than 25 years ago. And uh, yeah, here I am still doing it. So I'll stop the share and I'll open it up to folks out there. Hi, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing, being so generous with your time and telling us uh, so much about your practice and your process at Griffin, how like it changed from your application, which I remember seeing and being so excited about, to what you've been doing, and then leaving us with that last piece of um, like the last, uh, well, the fossil that you first uh, did and that you keep going back to. Uh, a reminder for all in attendance that uh, now we're gonna head into a Q&A session. So please, uh, if you have any questions, you do, use the Q&A uh, panel at the bottom of the screen and I will read the question out loud. You can also unmute yourselves and ask the question. Just give me a heads up by uh, raising your hand. And before we get any questions in, I thought I will, uh, chime in with my uh, first one. And uh, Natalie, you were talking about uh, Kathy Slade's or making a reference to Kathy Slade's uh, talk uh, at uh, CAG. And yeah, you brought up like uh, the frottages that you've been doing. And uh, I could, my mind went uh, exactly to like Kathy's piece. And uh, when you were talking about like in relation to what Kathy said of like really going back to uh, keep going back to this one our work that articulates your practice it, it kind of brought everything together for me because you are talking about like the micro and the macro in your work 
like these imprints across time, uh, the encounters that you have, and you have like vessels and networks as a motif in your artwork. Uh, so I, I keep trying to make these connections with like all the things you were br uh, bringing up and the references you were making. And uh, I have this uh, thing of like going back to our works because uh, there's a Mexican writer uh, that says that intuition uh, is actually articulated uh, by our own uh, notebooks. So if we look to old notebooks, we're going to find like pieces of ourselves that we are still working through now. So other than the fossil, have you found other motifs or pieces that keep articulating your practice in the present? Yeah, I mean, definitely geology is like the main thing that always comes back. Um, but the materials themselves, I, I'm, I'm, I, I do feel feel that objects are somehow um, lively and they're not just inanimate and they're not just these things they they actually you know there's there's more they, they vibrate and so I kind of tend to surround myself with stuff and stuff is kind of becomes a starting point for me a lot of the time mm -hmm. um, and what else can I say? I guess um, vessels, I, I, I always come back to vessels. Mm -hmm. I think again, because it was such an important part of um, my upbringing and thinking back. Um, and gosh, I don't know. I feel like it's all just the same stuff that I'm like rearranging and transforming. I'm not even sure I would be able to put my finger on it and because it's almost subconscious in a way. And um, you mentioned that talk and or you, you know brought it up again. And um, Kathy and Le Kathy Slade and Lisa Robertson were kind of going back and forth. They've had this relationship for over 30 years and how they do bounce ideas back and forth, but without even really realizing that they're doing it. And I think that's part of it. It's it's something that's so uh, becomes so much a part of you that you don't even recognize. Like it's hard for me to even be able to put my finger on what those things are. It's only when I'm putting a talk like this together that I'm like, hey, actually, I've been thinking about this for a long time. And so, mm -hmm. you know. When you're when you put everything out on the table then you can kind of make these connections but they're there all the time it's just hard to articulate them or, or even recognize them i think yeah and you realize them i remember seeing your um installation at uh ubc at the belkin gallery and uh yeah it, it you absolutely like blew my mind away when you introduced like this network uh connecting all these elements it, it was Wonderful, thank you. Thank <laughs> and you. Uh, we have uh, two questions here from our team at Griffin. So I'm going to start uh, with Jordana's question. You can see it in the chat, but I'm going to read it out loud for uh, captioning purposes. So uh, from Jordana, uh, they they say uh, you mentioned plants as self portraiture, uh, which I find beautiful and fascinating. Can you elaborate on how you conceptualize this? Hmm. I think, well, I'll, I'll talk about it in terms of um, flower arranging or ikebana, which is, um, as I already mentioned, it's one of the Zen practices. Um, and so it is a meditative practice. And so part of it is about selecting the um, going into nature, um, sort of uh, being chosen almost by the plants themselves and then and then selecting a vessel that becomes a part of the arrangement um, and arranging them in a way that um, says something and I feel like that could be considered a kind of portraiture and so not that it's um well I mean it also makes me come back to Durer again. I mean, I kind of hate to be bringing, keep going back to Albrecht Durer of all people, but um, he does just keep creeping in in, the, in, the, in my process over the past um, few weeks because I have been sort of forced to 
um, think about what I mean by self-portraiture. So what is a self-portrait? Portrait, And we kind of all know somewhere in the back of our minds that he was one of the, these first artists who made a self-portrait and felt like he was able to give himself permission to make a portrait of himself. And it's a very, um, I mean, it obviously looks like him, so it's representational. Um, but you know, nothing is ever just purely representational. It's always it's always doing something more. He made decisions about what he was wearing, what his facial expression was, um, how he wanted to present himself to the world. And so I think that a portrait can be anything. I, I feel like a portrait, um, whenever I make any kind of arrangement in my studio, it is a kind of portrait. It's the things that I have, it's the materials that I'm working with. It's the kind of things that are speaking to me in some way. And um, when they come together, they make, they make a portrait. And so I guess I'm thinking, uh, and, you know, and when I talk about Ikebana, I, that's sort of a, the same thing that I'm talking about. Not that the plants themselves are um, the portrait, but the plants can be a vehicle towards creating a portrait, I guess. Thank you. Um, and you're already touching on it, uh, but Lisa is reframing this question, so maybe you can elaborate uh, a little bit more. So I'm just going to read it now. You can see it in the chat, um, but I'll read it aloud for you. So it says, uh, thank you so much, Natalie, for uh, needing these layers, archaeologists, within your practice. I'm also thinking of your use of the word arrangement as you describe the process of working within your installations. I wonder if you could speak a bit more about your process of making decisions with these arrangements, especially within the context of Ikebana and archaeology in your own history. Hmm. <laughs> Very tricky. <laughs> I can hear Lisa laughing. Um, gosh, how do I frame things in that way? Um, I mean, my mind is sort of going all, all, on all of these different tangents. I almost feel like I need to make a diagram of, of that answer. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it would be a, it would be a stretch for me to try to sum that up. Or um, okay, let me look at the question again because I, I now have it in front of me. Um, the, your use of the word arrangement more about your process of making decisions. Mm. Well, I've, one of my goals for this residency has been to try to work in a bit more of an intuitive way. Um, I find that I am often starting from a really, um, not conceptual, but like a, um, I already kind of know what it is that I'm trying to do when I when I start. I'm thinking about the outcome before um, before I get into the process. So since I've been at um, Griffin, I've really tried. I've, I've made a very conscious attempt to try to let go of the outcomes and um, and treat things in a very intuitive way. And so in a way, making the arrangements does feel very intuitive. Um, and then as I'm making them, um, I'll notice kind of, uh, when, like when I was talking about the installations to lag mice, I'll kind of notice sort of parentheses around things or, um, you know, holding one thing next to another thing, you, they kind of create a relationship. And so I'll start to notice these small relationships and then I'll try to expand on that or, or elaborate on that in some way. And I mean, it's not always good, that's for sure. <laughs> like, I'm not even sure anything in here feels like it's arrived at something, which I'm, I'm trying to feel okay about. I'm, I really want this to be a time of expansion and exploration. Um, but yeah, I basically, when I get here, I, I have a, a sh brief meditation before I get started, just kind of like shake off the world and get centered. And then, um, 
and then I'll just get started. And I kind of let the materials dictate the direction in a way. And, um, you know, you can, as I mentioned also, I'm, I'm uh, influenced by what I'm looking at. So the trees outside and um, if I do go for a walk, then things that I notice on the walk, that might be a starting point. I did uh, bring in a few of those um, blackberry brambles and some English ivy, and I was kind of trying to work with that. It didn't really go anywhere, so I kind of, I'm also trying to be very willing to kind of let go of an idea if it's, if nothing's happening. Uh, which, and all of this is really new for me, so it feels like this has been a great opportunity for me to be able to try working in that way. I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> I tried, I did my best. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's just wonderful to hear you articulate uh, your answer because I feel like um, as much as you're practicing Ikebana, it seems like the materials you're working with are practicing Ikebana with you too, like kind of placing you constantly within these layers uh, of meaning uh, or signification. Uh, thank you so much for that answer. We have another one uh, by Julie uh, Papajan, and you can see it on the Q&A uh, like chat box. Uh, do you see it? Mm -hmm. Or I can copy paste it into the chat so you can read it as well, but I'm going to read it out loud uh, just for uh, captioning purposes. So Julie Papagen, thank you for your uh, question, Julie. Uh, she says, I am intrigued by the willow charcoal you were making. The image of the moss you showed is quite beautiful. Have you documented other plants uh, from this process? Have you made imprints or drawn uh, with these plants? Thank you. Yes. Um, the charcoal, I have tons of charcoal. I have charcoal made from all different kinds of plants now. I kind of got a little bit obsessed with making charcoal for a while. <laughs> and um, I make them in these uh, tin boxes. And when they come out of the fire, it's so magical. So you put the plant material into the box and then you put it in the fire, you poke a little hole, and when, um, when all of the oxygen is gone, so it has to be airtight, but when all of the oxygen is gone, I think uh, a, a little flame comes up, which means that, you know, it's time to, <laughs> all I know is that it means time to take the box out of the fire. Um, so you take it out, you let it cool, and then when you open it up, it's just this magical moment where you can, where you see all of the plant material now carbonized and it has this beautiful sheen to it. Um, and things that are shiny to begin with really um, become even more glossy and beautiful because the color has been removed. So they're all black. And um, sorry, I kind of forget what the question was. Oh, have I used the charcoal for, yeah, so originally I was only making willow charcoal, willow and grapevine, which is a traditional uh, material for, for drawing with, and it's beautiful to work with. It's really soft, um, it smudges very easily, and uh, so you can make a really nice, um, very, uh, yeah, soft effect with that kind of charcoal. And you can't really get really super black blacks as you would with compressed charcoal, but there's something very light and the sound that it makes is also uh, really tantalizing. It kind of, yeah. Um, and so my next, while I still have, I guess about two weeks here, um, I want to work on a really large drawing on the back wall using willow charcoal. And I, I might incorporate some of the other charcoal too. I'm not sure. I, I have tried some of it and it does, I tried making ink out of some leaves um, that weren't designed for <laughs> drawing with, but it didn't, I mean, they, it kind of worked. It's a little light, it's a bit gray as opposed to the darker, uh, richer gray that I was hoping for. But I am going to start a large charcoal drawing in the next weeks. Um, and yeah, we'll see what happens. I might try some frittage with the charcoal just to see if that has an interesting effect as well, or just to see what happens, I guess. Very exciting. And um, yeah, we have a comment uh, by Emily Thacker it's in the Q&A uh, panel box. I don't know if you know them, but uh, they are really interested in doing a charcoal making workshop with you. Um, 
So, do you know them? <laughs> I I'm not sure, Emily. Do I know you? <laughs> <laughs> we we can be in in touch for sure. And <laughs> I don't recognize um, your last name, but um, maybe we know each other more informally. Um, and yeah, I would I would be happy to do that. It's the tricky thing is finding a place where you can have a fire. So usually I I do this on Gambier Island, which um, you know when it's not fire season, it's pretty easy. Or, yeah, when it's not uh, when there's no fire bed, it's pretty easy to just build a fire and throw a tin box in there and and wait for it to burn off all of the oxygen. <laughs> but um, otherwise, it's a bit tricky to make a fire in the city, but maybe you've got a fireplace. Also, the stuff that burns off in the tins is kind of maybe a bit toxic because uh, they sometimes will have a, like a coating on them. So it's maybe not something you would want to do in your fireplace. <laughs> but I'm sure, you know, we could do smaller things. I've done, uh, I've made a lot of willow charcoal in um, kind of Altoid size tin boxes. And that's really easy. You can just put that in a wood stove or a fire small fire small backyard fire <laughs> <laughs> nice perfect and uh we have one last question uh is in the q a uh, panel box but i'll copy paste it to the chat and i'll read it out loud um okay so this one is from c stock rich and they say, hey, Natalie, thank you for this lovely presentation and your work. I find your work very calming, interesting, and uh, earthbound. You have mentioned meditation as part of your uh, practice and Nietzsche's idea of eternal recurrence. The, do the weeds weave all these things together? Carolyn, yes, they do weave all of these things together. I really do think that's part of my interest in making inks from weeds as well. Um, it's just another kind of material transformation. Um, the charcoal um, for me also is kind of like this, um, you know, this plant to carbon to, um, you know, eventually it will just become dust and enter back into the soil and then it will plants again so it is this looping thing and, and the, the weeds are so much a part of that and, and the weeds are going to keep going whether we do or, or not and um yeah that's definitely part of my fascination with the weeds also just i love thinking about um, the use value of weeds and how a lot of them are maybe weeds because they're considered weeds because they they're not doing what a particular group of people want them to be doing or you know they're trying to grow something else and then these weeds keep popping up and so but the weeds are just trying to do their own thing and I, I like knowing that the weeds also have other use values um, you know sometimes they have health benefits or sometimes they're they can be used for making um, textiles. I was making, I was collecting stinging nettle to make ink and tea and to eat, <laughs> but I also then discovered that uh, stinging nettle stalks have been used in textiles since the Neolithic age and um, and then I, so I tried to make some fiber out of it and I made some cordage with stinging nettle and it's just, it's so strong. It's very much like flax or linen and um, it's quite amazing. I, I mean, I'm not sure I would go quite so far as to like actually make enough thread to weave something or you know make a textiles piece in that way. But I just love knowing that it's this very versatile and multi-purpose plant that people find to be disruptive for some reason. But it's just doing its thing, and uh, some people are taking advantage of its many useful properties and other people aren't but yeah it goes across time again yeah it's like that it's the time imprint thing that is really fascinating to me about these thank you and uh one last comment maybe a follow-up coming from there uh from the same person uh they just say wonderful thank you the charcoal imprint and long live uh the weeps lovely 
Yes. Yay. <laughs> and thank you, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's been such a pleasure seeing how your work evolves in the residency and just seeing where you're taking everything. If folks in the audience are curious to see that charcoal uh, drawing by Natalie, well, you can join her on February 26th <laughs> with uh, the other resident, uh, uh, Rain, and they will be hosting an open studio uh, starting at noon, noon to five, so you can come join them in the studio, see what they've been up to. And with that, I just want to thank everyone, uh, Natalie uh, <laughs> specifically for this wonderful time and uh, everyone in attendance for joining us today for our uh, Live from the Studio with Natalie Perchwitz. We hope to see you at our next uh, Live from the Studio with Rain Cabana Boucher. Um, I'm going to put a link on the chat uh, for you to check out the event. And then just a reminder that our gallery at Griffin Art Projects has an exhibition at Libre Conundrum until May 7th. We are open Friday through Sunday, noon to 5 p.m. If you would like to know more about Griffin Art Projects, you can subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of our website. Uh, you will uh, see it in the chat box as well. And yeah, thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you. Everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.